Backing up data can be a bit of a tedious task, so many of us don't end up doing it as often as we should, despite our drives being full of so many irreplaceable files these days. So in this video, we'll be making the backup process much easier by making a one-click automatic backup system that requires no user interaction after pressing it. The net result is that backups are made much more regularly, as it's so easy to do. Laptop users can also benefit, as the same system can be set up for external drives where the backup process will automatically be triggered as soon as the drive is plugged in. This method doesn't require a button and is entirely software based, so I'll be covering it in more detail later in the video. We'll be building the button into a drive bay of a standard computer case to start with, but you can of course reposition the button to wherever you like, or even make it external, depending on your requirements. Using just any old button won't do, as we specifically need one that is latching and has two poles. Having two poles means that a button has two individual switches inside, allowing it to make or break two separate circuits. This is usually shortened as DP, which stands for double pole. As these switches are a little less commonly found, I've placed international purchasing links in the description to a variety of suitable switches for you to choose from that will work with this project. So let's begin by removing the drive bay cover. This process varies from case to case, but generally it involves removing the front facade of the chassis and simply unclipping it. Once we've got it, we can place it on some scrap wood and then drill a hole in it for the button. To make the process easier and more accurate, it's a good idea to start with a small drill bit and then progressively move to a larger one. If your largest drill bit is still too small for the button to fit through, it's possible to widen it with a circular file. It doesn't have to be perfect, as imperfections in the circle are masked by the button's lip. Now that the button's in, we can secure it in place using its nut. As you can see here, I've also drilled a hole for an LED, which we'll later configure to light up when the button is pressed. The next thing we'll need for this build is a SATA male to female power extension cable. To wire up the button to it, we'll first cut through the yellow wire, which corresponds to the 12 volt rail on the power supply, and solder a spare length of yellow wire to one of the ends, wrapping the joint afterwards with electrical tape or heat shrink. The other end of this extension can now be soldered to the button, but first we need to identify which contacts to solder it to. So after making sure that the button is on, we can use a multimeter to check which contacts get connected together, and then solder the yellow extension to either one of them. Now we can get yet another length of spare yellow wire, and solder it to the other contact. Its loose end can now be soldered to the remaining wire on the power cable. These steps need to be repeated in exactly the same way for the red wire, which is the 5 volt rail. However, on the spare length of wire that connects to the female side of the power cable, we need to add an extra little blue wire. This is for wiring up to the LED later. The LED obviously needs a ground connection too, so we can cut through either one of the black wires on the power cable and twist them back together again after exposing the ends. This leaves us with some exposed copper, to which we can solder a ground wire for the LED. After insulating the joint, we can solder the end of this wire to the cathode leg of the LED. For reference, the cathode leg of an LED is usually the one that goes to the larger plate inside the diode itself. To the other leg, we can solder a current limiting resistor. This drops the 5 volt rail down to whatever the LED needs, and you can use the values in this chart depending on the colour of your LED. To the other end of this resistor, we can solder that extra blue wire that we added earlier. The LED can now be inserted into its hole and glued in place. So that's the backup button completed, and it's ready to fit into the case. However, if you are the kind of user who likes a tidy looking interior to your PC, you might want to consider using some braided sheathing to give it a more professional appearance. So now we can put the computer back together, and plug the button in between the power supply and an additional blank hard drive, which will soon function as the backup hard drive. 
so after making sure that the backup button is already on, we can boot the computer up and enter into the BIOS, as we need to enable SATA hot swapping so that the computer will treat the backup drive as removable storage. This feature is available on most decent motherboards, however if yours doesn't have it there is a walkaround which I'll go into more detail about later. Now the process of enabling hot swapping will vary depending on your motherboard brand, so you may need to refer to the user manual if you don't know how to do it. So once hot swapping is enabled for the backup drive, we can save the changes and let the computer now boot into Windows. Now when the backup button is pressed, the drive should be detected automatically by the system, and we can now set up the software for it. So to get the backup to launch automatically, we'll be using a free piece of software called Free File Sync. As the official installer annoyingly tries to install optional adware, take extra care to deselect it during installation. After installing it, we can launch the main program by double-clicking the green icon on the desktop. We'll start by choosing the folders that we want the software to back up by pressing the Browse button on the left-hand side. For now, let's go with the My Documents folder. Now we need to choose the backup destination, so we'll click the Browse button on the right-hand side and make a new folder on the backup hard drive with the same name as the Source folder. It's worth noting that we can add more Source folders and destinations by simply pressing the green plus icon. Now we can press the green cog on the right and change the mode to Mirror Mode. This mode is what I recommend for most users as it makes an exact copy of your source files and synchronizes deletions. Now there are plenty of other ways you can configure the software, so if you think another method will suit your needs better, do feel free to check them out, as they do include quite powerful features such as historical backups and versioning. So now we can hit OK and save our settings as a batch job by pressing this icon. We'll save it to the C drive so we can easily access it. Once we're done we can close the program and open the second icon that was placed on the desktop which launches the monitoring configuration. So we'll go to File, Open and select the batch file we just made. As you can see, it's added both the source and destination folders. Now we can go to File and again save it to the C drive and then close the window. Going to the C drive, we can see we have a new red batch file. This red batch file links back to the original batch file, so we need to leave the original one where it is. The red batch file, however, can be dragged into the startup folder in the start menu. This means that the computer will automatically launch the batch file at system startup, meaning that it will always sit quietly in the background, waiting for the backup drive to be turned on. So all that's left to do now is try it out. So we'll press the backup button, and the backup process should initiate by itself. Once the backup's completed, we can simply press close and turn off the backup drive. Now as the backup drive is physically disconnected from the power supply when it's not actually backing up, data is given another layer of protection against power supply failures and even ransomware. So what about using external drives with this method? Well, the software side of things is exactly the same, just set up your backup folders on the external drive instead. Now the backup will initiate as soon as you plug it in. Handy! So what do you do if your motherboard doesn't support SATA hot swapping? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there is a walkaround, which is simply to get a SATA to USB converter and hook it up to the motherboard using one of the spare USB ports or headers. So if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and perhaps consider subscribing if you haven't already. Also, if you're interested in another hard drive related video, then why not check this one out in which we attempt to recover the data from a dead drive. The results are really surprising. Other than that, I'll uh, see you next time. Bye for now.